Explicitycast from Explicity. Millions of citizens around the world are today asking questions of grave importance. What's happening to democracy? A way of governing and living that until recently was said to have enjoyed a global victory. Why is it everywhere reckoned to be in retreat or facing extinction? They're surely right to wonder. Three decades ago, democracy seemed blessed. People power mattered. Public resistance to arbitrary rule changed the world. Military dictatorships collapsed. Apartheid was toppled. There were velvet revolutions followed by tulip, rose and orange revolutions. Political rats were arrested or put on trial, suffered death in custody, or were shot on the spot. Now things are different. And so, through the thickening fog and dooming gloom, we must ask some basic questions. Why shouldn't today's Democrats just bid adieu to the ideals and institutions of power-sharing democracy? Doesn't realism dictate the need to accept the urgings of Putin, of Erdogan, Modi and other despots to concede that the time has come to prepare the last rites of the Western shambles called democracy? To see that the new world order emerging from the collapse of the Soviet Union, war in Europe, disorder in the Arab world, the decline of the American empire, the return of a belligerent Russia and a self-confidently ambitious China, that all this favors top-down despotic rule, not democracy. In short, why be on the wrong side of history? Why cling to that old hat thing called democracy? Why indeed should different peoples with diverse interests at different points on our planet favor democracy as a way of life? Why must they commit to greater public accountability, the humbling of the powerful, the equalization of life chances for all? Could democracy instead be a fake global norm, a pseudo-universal ideal that jostles for attention, dazzles with its promises, and, for a time, seduces people into believing that it is a weapon of the weak against the strong, when in reality it's just organized bribery of the poor by the rich, an ignorant belief in collective wisdom, an accomplice of human crimes against nature, a pretentious for value peddled by second-rate shopkeepers with second-rate eyes, the 19th century German anti-philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche thought. Said differently, is democracy really to be valued in Cape Town and Caracas as much as in Chennai, Canberra, Copenhagen and Chongqing? In tackling these ethical questions, retrieving and breathing life into the past justification democracy isn't an option because, here comes a surprise, the history of democracy is littered with dogmatic, strangely anti-democratic, and self-contradictory justification of why democracy is a universal male. Let's take a few examples. The 19th century Christian view, expressed in American publisher Nahum Capon, attempt to write the first full-length history of democracy, was that democracy is desirable because it draws inspiration and truth from the Gospels. Well, that's bad news for Muslims, Hindus, Confucians, and others. Early modern champions of national sovereignty insisted that each nation, they like the upper case, was entitled to govern it, and that struggles for national self-determination had history with an uppercase H on their side. In practice, that doctrine proved often to be murderous, such as for Irish Catholics, condemned to be underdogs in a dominant nation-state, for Palestinians and Kurds who were stateless, or for Romani, Sami, Inuit, and other indigenous peoples who were deemed unfit 
or nationhood. Philosophically speaking, the trouble with these old justifications isn't only they are in contradiction, they suffer from single-mindedness. They presume their justification of democracy is universally applicable because it rests on a timeless first principle that requires Democrats, as well as their opponents, to bow down in its presence. That philosophical conceit, of course, rubs against the self-questioning and leveling spirit of democracy. Talk of God, nation, and history isn't just doctrinaire metaphysics. Its pontifical quality contradicts the whole idea of democracy as the defender of an open diversity of ways of life, freed from the bossy dictates of the high and mighty. There are many who believe that the cradle of democracy was ancient Greece. But, if anything, Greece may lay claim to the etymology of the word democracy, but not to democracy itself. Whence then? The short answer by many historians is that the first evidence of democracy was in the Syrian Mesopotamian region, and that was around 2500 BC, and this democracy was characterized by assemblies of people. And then about 1,000 years later, which is around 1500 BC, the Indian subcontinents are pretty much the same thing. And in the thousands of years since, we have seen the growth and the development of democracy marked by a greater inclusiveness of all its stakeholders, which means everyone gets a vote. But to see all of it laid out in a convenient timeline is both fascinating and illuminating, because it gives us ready reference and quick context. My guest today is John Keane, historian and professor of politics at the University of Sydney. John Keane is credited with introducing and popularizing the term monetary democracy in his book The Life and Death of Democracy, published in 2009. His formulation of monetary democracy has gained widespread recognition and influence in the field of political theory as a distinct and important form of democratic governance. John's latest book, The Shortest History of Democracy, is a concise journey through the history of democracy from those ancient Mesopotamians through the present day. And to have the ability to pull this off in less than only 250 pages, would have taken a lifetime of learning. John's contributions to the field of political science have been both profound and influential. His research has focused on a wide range of topics, from democratization and globalization, to political violence and the role of media in politics. But it all begs the question that very few of us can answer, and I'm not one of them. What is democracy? I grew up completely convinced that my government, if you like, is the moral equivalent of, um, of an apartment building manager to whom I would offer this job description. Keep things clean, keep things safe and in working condition, and you don't get to decide what I can and cannot watch on cable TV. But in reality, well... The study of democracy and its history is the reality in which we all live, an always fluid, even roller coaster state of affairs, it seems. But the importance of a historian in the mix goes back to that time worn adage about repeating history. But I can't help but wonder what went right, what went wrong, where is democracy headed? And this is a question that really visits us all, even our listeners who don't really live in a democracy. And this is a timeless conversation, and it's one that I cannot wait to have with John. Happily, I don't have to wait, because here he is, joining me from Sydney, Australia. John Keane, welcome to the Literary City. Thank you very much, Ramji. I am indeed in Sydney, which the great American writer Gore Vidal once said... Uh, is the city that San Francisco would like to have been. 
Did he? I, I don't remember reading that. Where was it? I think it's an essay in which uh, he, uh, shortly written after he visited this fine city, both Pacific cities, of course, with large gay communities and Mediterranean-type climates. How interesting. I never thought of their geographies in, in that way. Okay, now to plunge in. I will start with a question that is a little on the formulaic side for your book, the history of democracy. Now, you say that it didn't all begin in ancient Greece. Yes, um, put on the table the scandalous idea that democracy is not an invention of the West, but thanks to archaeologists, uh, including a Danish archaeologist, uh, Torkild Jakobsen, who worked in the 1920s and 30s in the Syria Mesopotamia region, thanks to their work, uh, we now know that assemblies were regularly practiced at least two millennia before they were in Athens. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that the whole idea that Athens is the birthplace of democracy uh, is a 19th century invention. And thanks to this archaeological research, it, it, it's now not plausible. It is now clear that in cities like Nippur and Babylon, there were vibrant assemblies often of commoners and including also women who decided whether they would pay uh, taxes, whether they would go to war or, or um, whether they would consent to a peace agreement. And so on. This was regularly practiced. Those assemblies were transported uh, to the east, uh, to, to the subcontinent, uh, and also to the west through the Phoenician world into the Greek world where the Greeks had the bombast to uh, claim that they were the inventors of self-government of people through assemblies. And did this bombast include inventing the word democracy? Yes. In my, in my work, I also pay attention to uh, the poetry of uh, democracy and the key term. I mean, democracy keeps her secrets very close to her chest. We don't know who first used in classical Greek this word demokratia, demos, the people, uh, kratos, kratin, to rule. But in earlier languages, including Linear B, which is a language which was only decoded in the 1950s, which has a family of terms uh, like damos, damakoi, which refer to um, a group of people uh, who govern themselves. Uh, and so it turns out that the etymology of, of democracy is also traceable to times earlier than Athens. Hasn't there always been some form of public participation in governance? Would you count things like protests, coups, uh, religious reformation movements, church and state, and so on, to be building blocks of democracy? The point, I think, um, Ramji, has to be handled very carefully because we now know that there were historical moments where rebellions of people, flesh and blood people, produced um, terrible forms of government. One thinks of the 1920s and the, the 1930s in Germany, for example, right, uh, where we now know that popular rebellions can have fascist qualities. But the flip side is that democracy is a way of handling power, a way of life that supposes that people do not need to be governed by tyrants or aristocrats or despots or demagogues or monarchs, that people are good enough to our share power and to decide for themselves how they will live together without great violence, that it is possible to change power relations, that nothing is fixed in stone, that nothing is natural. Mm -hmm. This is to say that democracy is a friend of, of contingency. It is, of course, a friend of hope. When it takes root, people come to believe that it's possible to improve their lives that it is possible to put an end to the bossing and bullying that brings them misery. Despite evidence from books such as yours and from similar scholarly works, 
We understand that democracy has evolved over thousands of years from different parts of the world. But from recent political uh -huh. rhetoric, it would appear that the West believes that democracy is theirs to defend and propagate. So, who owns democracy? Democracy is, to flip your question upside down, Ramjeev, democracy is the public ownership. Mm -hmm. Democracy is the enemy of fixity. Uh, it has um, it has a rebellious quality to it, and so when groups claim to uh, be the custodians of its true meaning, that's the point at which uh, Democrats with us will be uh, spring into action. Mm -hmm. Let's talk specifically about the United States. There is always so much posturing over there about. Uh, defending democracy and uh, the democratic way of life, and much war has been waged in its name. Yet, they have been somewhat late to the party, haven't they? Many of the things that we would consider uh, germane to democracy, they have instituted uh, in my lifetime. And yet, do you not think it's somewhat insidious that they would uh, name and blame democracy for a lot of what they do? Well, it's a, it's a beautiful question, Ramji, and it's a very complicated question that requires a very lengthy answer, and we don't have time, fortunately, for, for listeners uh, to, to go through it. But I will say a few things about um, America and democracy. First of all, the revolution uh, of 1776, the Declaration of Independence and the writing of a constitution, is not done in the name of democracy. Uh, those who say that Frank Fukuyama, for instance, are committing a, a kind of um, anachronism. Uh, the language was Republican, small r Republican. It was self-government. It was power sharing. And Rome was one of the um, inspirations, the key inspiration of those who wrote the Constitution and agreed it in 1787. Mm -hmm. so this is the first thing. Right. Second thing is that it was a democracy uh, when that word began to be used at the very end of the 18th century, around the time of Thomas Jefferson's first presidency, it was a democracy that rested upon slavery. Right. And, of course, so too uh, were the uh, Greek democracies, the assembly democracies of the ancient world. They were. Uh, typically, there was an underclass of slaves who did perform the necessary labors or what were considered to be the necessary uh, labors of, uh, of life. And a civil war was fought in the United States about whether the emergent American democracy was Greek or modern. Mm -hmm. And the pro-slavery Democrats lost, or at least they lost uh, a major battle and then did everything they could to prolong forms of slavery in the name of democracy. A third thing to say about uh, America is that as it emerged uh, during the course of the 19th century, it became an empire. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of the themes that runs through my work is the relationship between democracy and empire. There have been three in its history. One was Athens. It became the most powerful democracy, uh, seafaring democracy in the Eastern Mediterranean. Two was uh, the French Revolution the Jacobins, and the Napoleonic thrust of the revolution, which in the name of um, uh, the citizen and the rights of, of man, uh, took a military campaign into the heartlands of, of Europe and failed. Right. And the third uh, and the only global empire uh, is that of the United States. And, of course, what... Um, many people in the world today uh, observe is that there is an incompatibility between an empire, a big state whose economic, political, diplomatic, cultural power spills out over its borders. Right. Where military bases situated in 80 countries with more than 750 military camps, an empire that spends in 2023 10 times more on armaments than the next countries, those practices are incompatible with the idea 
the ideal that democracy is self-government of people wherever they live. And that tension, I think, we're seeing play out in the present period. That's a very important dimension of American democracy that um, shouldn't be underestimated. It is, of course, an open question whether we're witnessing the decline of the American empire. And to the extent that that's happening, I believe it is. And this is not good news for democracy's future. That was a great summary of democracy. And I'm going to cycle back to where it's all headed. But first, this question. Why is it that the West is credited with democracy? Is it because they codified it first? Example, Magna Carta? It is a question that's connected to what is taught in schools, what elected leaders say. It is heavily bound up with the rise to global ascendancy of the United States. And yes, the narrative is that democracy is a Western invention. Uh, it is part of Western civilization. And, well, in my work, I tried to pick that apart. Um, the life and death of democracy was, I think, a very early attempt. When the language of democracy spread, it underwent what anthropologists call an indigenization. Any examples? In Bhutan, where there's much discussion of democracy, we can see on the ground that Bhutan has done something to democracy. India has done something to democracy. Um, it's not a carbon copy of American-style so-called liberal democracy with an American accent. <laughs> uh, India added things like the whole notion of secularism. This is not a repetition of uh, North, uh, North Atlantic region understandings of the role of religion in politics. Uh, what India, the, the whole Indian notion of secularism was an Indianization of the understanding of democracy and a very important innovation which today is under great uh, pressure. This is something new in the history of democracy. It's something very exciting. It's something for researchers and writers. Right. And I'd say that for anyone interested in this subject, your book, The Life and Death of Democracy, is a must-read. Yeah, it's a, it's a thousand pages. Yes, that's And true. one should be careful reading it in bed because you can, you can be injured, you know, if you <laughs> fall asleep accidentally. Oh, come now, John. Who could ever fall asleep reading a history book? <laughs> <laughs> now, in Life and Death of Democracy, I'm interested in the second part, the death of it. And I was intrigued by this passage where you speak of the Democracy Club, uh, Madeleine Albright's initiative, and you write, and I quote, the number of democratic states has more than doubled in a generation, dictators, who seldom need pretexts, have everywhere dressed up in democratic clothes, forced to bow to fashion, <laughs> nice, Jintao, Putin, Gaddafi, Li, claimed to be Democrats, all the while using the language of democracy to cover their tracks. Drawing from that passage, often the death of democracy is seen as the result of a despot trashing the constitution, taking over and then doing it all by the seat of the pants. Sure. Is it not of greater concern when there's consensus? even won by silence of the majority. It has been known to happen before, hasn't it? Yes, I've become very interested uh, of late in uh, how democracies die uh, quickly or slowly. So which one is it? Uh, we have this bad habit of thinking that democracy dies in a puff of smoke. Mm -hmm. January the 6th. Right, of course. In the United States is portrayed by journalists and others in this way. Right. Or going back in time when Salvador Allende in the presidential palace uh, in Chile takes his own life with Air Force jets strafing the presidential building with troops gathering. You know, that seemed to be the moment at which democracy dies. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it turns out from my research and thinking historically about democracy that it can die in different rhythms. and. One of those rhythms is the populist dynamic in which it takes about a decade to destroy democracy in the name of democracy. And the way you do it is a political party is formed. 
in a society where there's a lot of disgruntlement and that party, led by a strong leader who quickly becomes a demagogue, wins. And after that first victory, they prepare for a second victory. And as they are governing, they begin to put their fingers around the neck of the local judiciary. They don't like independent judiciaries. Juristocracy is Edoyan's term. They try to politicize a civil service to turn it into a sympathetic institution. They round on journalists. In short, what this alternative pathway to democide involves is the slow motion in the name of the people, strangulation of independent power sharing, monetary watchdog institutions, which for me are very important in the whole definition of democracy. And you have written about the longer form of democide, which is through environmental degradation. And I urge people to read you on that. But first, the phrase liberal democracy, what is that? And why don't we have it? Yeah, I, uh, about liberal democracy, it's actually a neologism from the 19th century, and it principally happened in the United States. It rolls off the tongues of politicians and citizens and journalists without much thought. Uh, it sounds good. Liberal democracy is, on the one hand, uh, an ideal that supposes that people can govern themselves as equals, and yet, on the other hand, historically, it was always the defender of private property, of markets. In a word, capitalism, that itself is a system of property ownership that produces inequalities of wealth and power. And so built into the notion of liberal democracy is a great tension, which has been exposed in the last several decades uh, with the coming into fashion of the word neoliberalism. When neoliberalism is used as a term globally, it refers to this fetish of markets, of, uh, of private property and of inequality. And that's incompatible with democracy. So this, this uh, observation that liberal democracy is oxymoronic, mm -hmm. that it has, you know, built into it a very deep tension, it doesn't go down well in liberal democratic circles. So I, I have tried to point that out in my work. I've also tried to point out that there is a, a very American quality to this phrase, liberal democracy, and to point out as well that India is not a liberal democracy. The, the central unit of analysis of liberalism is the individual. But in India, people think in terms of caste, of, of group, of, of, of language groups, and so on. So this is a term that, for me, liberal democracy is a kind of zombie term. It should be buried. It should rest in peace. Not a good descriptor of the way democracy is working in the four corners of the earth. Now, you have written the shortest history of democracy. How do you take all of that and compress it into less than 250 pages? What do you leave out? I try to say, uh, Ramji, in the opening pages of this book, that there is and there will never be a final history of democracy. Right. That what I have done is openly point out that I'm selecting people, characters, events, institutions, and their histories. I'm selecting them to try to make sense of the way things are going in these years of the 21st century. Behind this is the principle that people who are ignorant of the past invariably misunderstand the present, and therefore their understanding of the future is, is mal-shaped. So um, there is a definite arbitrariness to every history. Every self-respecting historian with integrity knows that. And in this short work, I openly admit that there is a selectivity at work. That what I'm trying to do, however, in this work is to, is to make more visible losers, those who have been forgotten. A lot of energy, hard work, tears, confusions went into it. I can well imagine. Now, as a final question, your phrase, monetary democracy, is something that you came up with again about a decade ago. But is it well and thriving? Is it workable? Can it be killed off? Monetary democracy, as I see it, this third phase 
in its history is alive. Can it be killed off? Yes. What would kill it off? Well, global nuclear war, certainly. Bio-destruction, yes. The growing gap between rich and poor, if it's not uh, reversed. Are children going to bed hungry at night? One third of Indian children do. I mean, those kinds of trends can slowly but surely destroy its spirit. But for the moment, uh, there is plenty of life left in it. And one of the implications of this shortest history of democracy is that power mongers are, are warned. They are forewarned that things can happen that bring them tumbling back to earth, can bring them tumbling down. That is the point of democracy, that it cannot live comfortably with predators, with despots, demagogues, bullies, manipulators. It is opposed to characters of that kind. And for that reason, it's likely to have a long life. Well, that certainly puts everything in a positive note. And I withdraw the question that I was about to ask you, which is, do you think we're going to hell in a handbasket? Uh -huh. Now, before we go, I want to point out that this show is called The Literary City. Yeah. Your prose is the prose of a literary writer. You pay a lot of attention to your writing and your style. And uh, is this because you do have strong literary influences? Yes. And uh, I could say that with an Irish name, Keen, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it somehow is in my blood <laughs> to pay attention to language. I submit. Sam Beckett famously said, it's all we have. <laughs> More power to your elbow. And on that wonderful note, John Keen, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Ramji, it was my great pleasure. Uh, I wish you all the very best for Literary City. It's a wonderful initiative and um, may it go global. And that was John Keane, Professor of Politics, University of Sydney, and the author of the book, The Shortest History of Democracy. It's quite a work. And there's a link in the podcast description to where you can buy that book. And I'll be back with that wonderfully fun segment, What's That Word?, where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time, but never stop to think about, right after this. <music> I'm back with What's That Word and with my co-host. Here she is. Hello. My name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hello, P with an A, but not another E. Are you kicking back in the democracy? Certainly kicking back in the meaning of it all. Hey, another great interview. Thank you. John Keane, a world authority on democracy. He is too. So what was your takeaway from it? Well. All of it. I mean, Keen was illuminating and I learned so much about democracy. Quite right. And I liked your question, who owns democracy? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so who does own democracy? The uh, most eloquent answer to that question can be found in uh, Keen's books, really, where he points out how the West tends to uh, conflate the norms of democracy with Christianity, you know, and try to make it theirs. Right, you yeah, they mean? do do that very well, yeah. I'm also amused by the, you know, constant American assertion that they must defend democracy around the world. I get that. You know, your question on the US democracy was similarly interesting. And the reason is, I guess it's because I can't decide if their system of checks and balances worked or worked, or if just a few conscientious people saved democracy for them. You mean after January 6th? That too. But I mean right through the, well, of late, the Trump presidency. Well, maybe other presidencies too. I wouldn't know. But, you know, it worked. Uh, the, the whole principle of checks and balances appears to have worked with Nixon and Watergate. But Trump was kind of overt, wasn't he, it seems. And uh, the big question is, did his speech on Jan 6th rise to the criminal or is this whole thing just too embarrassing for them? I don't know. I guess there are some answers we will not have. We will not. But the interview was so instructive. You know, mm. every time you interview an author, I realize how little I know. 
if it's any consolation that goes for me too. The truth is every one of our guests, they bring so much of themselves to the table. They really do. Uh, you might say that they wrote the book on instructor. <laughs> That's funny. It's a terrible PJ, but still oh. funny, I will grant. Okay, P with an A. What are we discussing today? What's that word? In one of your questions to John Keane, you used the mm -hmm. expression... To hell in a handbasket. Yes, I did. Well, nice. Are we doing that? You know, it's one of my favorites. Yes, great. Okay, you do the <laughs> meaning first. Sure. Okay, so to go to hell in a handbasket quite clearly means to go to one's doom or a situation that is surely headed for disaster. Yes, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I must tell you, I had an uncle and he would put the newspaper down and intone gravely, the world is headed to hell in a handbasket. You know, maybe that's where I got it from. But every time he said it, we kids shivered. But I think we were afraid of the handbasket. You know, you see, hell is only a concept, but the handbasket are real. Handbaskets are real. <laughs> So now to the etymology, please. Well, this is one of those interesting phrases, the origins of which are unclear. Of course. Okay, some say the origins of the phrase are somewhat bloody and go back to the uh, guillotine, where, if Hollywood is to be believed, they caught the decapitated bits, namely the head, oh. in a handbasket, right? So their soul would go to hell in a handbasket. Oh, Hollywood, really? <laughs> well, you know you can trust Hollywood. They check their facts over and over and then a third time <laughs> until they are certain. They live for truthful and accurate depictions. <laughs> yes. In fact, I've heard the same things about Hollywood. The problem with this story is that the guillotine was invented only in the 18th century. <laughs> And, uh, As a headache cure? <laughs> funny. <laughs> but the phrase actually was used much earlier, way back in the 17th century. Oh, wow. Where? Well, I found this version of To Hell in a Handbasket from this uh, real page-turner, the zinger, called The Weekly Packet of Advice from Rome. That was the name of, mm -hmm. the, uh, of the magazine. Or it's called The History of Popery, 1682. Popery? What's popery? It's a noun. <laughs> it's a noun. A funny noun. <laughs> it cracks me up. Popery. <laughs> well, you may laugh, but this word is also used mockingly by non-Catholics to describe, you know, the ritual practices of the Catholic Church and, and make fun of them. So they, they use popery in that dismissive way. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a portmanteau of... Mockery and potpourri. Mockery and potpourri. <laughs> That's silly. Okay, please continue. What was in the potpourri? <laughs> All right, these words were in the potpourri, not the potpourri. These words with hell in a handbasket from that, from that magazine. And I quote, The noise of a popish plot yeah. was nothing in the world but an intrigue of the Whigs to destroy the king's best friends, and the devil may fetch me to hell in a handbasket. If I might have my will, there should not be one fanatical dog left alive in the three kingdoms. <laughs> okay, I have to stop you there. Popish plot? <laughs> this is getting worse. <laughs> you... From all that, you got popish plot. You better cut this out. Anyway, another version of the phrase is hell in a handcart. And there is this painting by, by Bosch, Hieronymus Bosch, the famous painter, and it's titled The Hay Wayne, where, you know, insignificant sinners are being taken to hell in a handcart. See? This Bosch guy was full of antichrist and hell and gloom, wasn't he? It's true. No one liked him. He didn't get invited to many parties. <laughs> he didn't bring any good news? Well, my name is Bosch. Hieronymus Bosch didn't quite make the cut. <laughs> Which cut? The Hollywood cut. Oh, from the guillotine at that. <laughs> 
And thus, we reprised a handbasket. Well, but I intend to keep my head about me. I don't. I'm off to hell in a handbasket this evening. Oh, have fun and be good. Be good? What I planned is no popish plot. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. And that is our show. I'd like to thank my guest, John Keane, and my co-host, Pranati P. with an A, Madhav, and you for listening, for writing, and for being so supportive. Now, before you go, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already subscribed. And please hit that like button and give us some stars or a nice comment or whatever it is that you really feel. All right? You have a wonderful time and see you very, very soon. Bye now. Bye now.